FEA is where the fun happens, isn't it? A lot of people just want to jump straight into FEA analysis and model that complex structure. This can lead to a lot of different pitfalls and lead to a lot of errors and mistakes. And there's some basic steps that you should run through to make sure that your FEA analysis is effective and correct. So let's break it down in detail. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Before you jump into any assessment, you need to ask yourself, what am I actually looking for out of this analysis? as certain programs have certain capabilities. So you need to making sure that you're grabbing the right tool for the right purpose. As just jumping into any analysis and trying to do the most complex assessment can lead to either a really long assessment to see what the answers are or a really complex model and being it really hard to debug. So you're looking for stresses, are you looking for deflections? Are you looking for just axial loads? What are the outputs that you're currently looking for is the first question that you should always ask yourself before just jumping into that software. And then looking at the different tools that you have available to you and working out which one's going to be the best for it. Sometimes you might need to compare against different results so you can build up that knowledge and making sure that your assessment is correct. Now we have started to think about what software we're going to use. Before we actually jump into that analysis, we need to ask, how do we know if the results are going to be correct or not? As sometimes we can just jump into our assessment, get an answer back. How do you know it's even in the right order of magnitude? So typically this is where I like to build up from a really simple model and build into that more complex model if needed. If you can't break down that more complex idea, you don't have enough knowledge yet to be able to assess whether the results you're getting out of that complex assessment are correct or not. Yes, that more simpler forms may be a little bit more conservative, but it allows you to get an order of magnitude of the results. Before I jump into any model, I typically like to start with a more simpler program or doing a quick hand assessment. As with any structural analysis, you need a starting point of where your model is going to be. So how big are those columns going to be? How thick are the slabs going to be? Where are they currently going to be positioned? And what type of spans are you trying to achieve? Now, a lot of this stuff can be quickly done through rules of thumb. So you know your span to depth ratios to get how big your span is going to be. And sometimes you know with a 200 thick slab, you can achieve eight to nine meters between columns. So if you've got a 10 or 12 meter span, you know that you need additional support in this area or the slab needs to be locally thickened up. You can also do the same thing quickly with the size of a column. For example, if you've got the height of the building, and you look at the average tributary area on that column, times it by the number of floors and size it between 10 to 15. Now you can do a quick detailed calculation about how much KPA is bearing on that column, but typically it's somewhere between 10 and 15. So let's pick 12, for example. So we've got 10 floors, we've got an area of roughly 64 meters, that's an eight by eight area of slab. So 10 times 64 times 12, roughly gives us a rounded up load of 7,700 kilonewtons. Now we've got the load, how do we size up that column? We're all in a 10 story building. We're gonna have somewhere between 50 and 65 concrete capacity at the bottom. And using a simple rule of thumb of 0.45 F-C, we can get a rough area of that column. So using 65 MPA times 0.45 F-C, we can see that we've got a column that's roughly about 550 square. So now we've got the initial sizings. This is a basic way that we can start to jump into the assessment. We can also check up the height of the building and look at where we're going to step back the column or where we're going to step back the concrete grade. So this is the basic step that we need to go through. Do these more simple assessments to know whether an analysis later is correct or not. Because if we skip this step, we have no idea where our starting point is, what size the columns are need to be molded, or whether our answers are correct. The biggest problem with such advanced software such as FEA is garbage in equals garbage out didn't know when you've got garbage and which one it is. Now it's not to say that your hand assessments are already correct or the FEA is already correct, just a way of assessing your, your structure. So if you do find a discrepancy, you need to go back and double check them. But now after we've started that initial assessment and got a ballpark of where we've got to be, let's jump into the single acronym that'll help you break down any model, making sure you've got all the data and using the correct tool for the assessment that you need to do. This simple acronym is GLAD or GLAD. G and now that's for geometry. We need to know where things are going to be positioned. Now you may think this is quite simple, but when you actually break it down, it can be quite complex because depending on the assessment that you're doing, there's different levels of fidelity that you need for each assessment. You're doing a stability assessment. You can make a lot of simplifications to help make that analysis run quickly, but not affect the overall results. For example, you can ignore a transfer element. So example, if you've got a single column that's transferring onto another transfer slab, you can ignore that element as it doesn't have a significant impact on the stability and where the loads are going in your assessment, provided it's not a long blade wall. So by running that column through the full height of the structure, you can prevent some of the errors that you may happen 
if you had that transfer structure there, as some models can detach and cause significant errors. And those errors are not actually beneficial. And this simplification allows you to run this assessment quickly without running into those bespoke problems. But if you made that same simplification for a slab design, for example, you didn't provide the transfer structure on an element, there would be concerns there because you've underdesigned the transfer load. So you may need to make sure that you're making the correct decisions for the correct areas. Yeah, some ideas you might think, well, I'm just gonna do the B the most complex assessment, making sure that we're designing every single transfer. But there's sometimes you can spend many hours debugging a model with a transfer in it, where you will have got exactly the same result if you had that column running straight through. But as I said, if you are doing that slab design, you need to making sure that transfer load is applied to the structure, otherwise you will underdesign it. That can cause catastrophic failures. But even when we're looking at slab design, it doesn't need to be that precise. Plus or minus a couple hundred mils is not the end of the world. But if you're doing a bespoke connection, for example, you need to making sure the loads are transferring from one side to the other, a couple hundred mils can lead to significant different changes in your design, either underdesign or overdesign, depending on which way you've moved them. You don't need to spend a lot of time on a slab design, making sure that position is exactly to the millimeter. But if you are doing a bespoke connection, you may have a lot more fidelity in your model, which takes you more time and needs more precision. L, which is the next part of the GLAD acronym, is for loads. And again, you may be thinking this is just a simple breakdown. You just look at the loads on the structure, apply it to your model, get out an answer. Yes, if you're doing a simple column assessment, this is probably correct. But if you're looking at a more complex system such as a slab, there is a time history element that can greatly affect the results that you're getting out. Say, for example, if you're cracking the props at four days, it means that you're deloading the slab and you can self-weight on the structure over. So you're getting significantly earlier cracking events as the slab is at a weaker state. And this can be significantly change the results at the end by millimeters. So it can have significant impact on your load history event. So if we break down the slab event, we start off with cracking the props at four days, which we only assess for the self weight of the structure. We then wait to the 28 day strength. And then we apply the full service load to get a full cracking assessment. Now a slab, you need to design for a 30 year or 100 year design life, depending on where you are. 30 year design life does not need to apply that full service load. So you have a long-term sustained load that is a reduced rate as you're not gonna have the full service load on that structure for that full time. You start off with your first short-term cracking load at self-weight at four days, wait until 28 days, put a full service load on it to get your starting initial assessment for the cracking events in the slab. Then you use your sustained load for the long term to see what the creep effects are and finally getting back to that long term service load to making sure you're checking your long term deflections. So you can see there's a breakdown in that time history event has made the loading more complex and you need to making sure that you're gathering both not only the short term, long term and the time history, especially when you're looking at the slab and long term deflections. This is, can be even more complex when we're going into such loads as such as seismic or wind. So when we look at wind, the complexity is exponential. And so a lot of time what you need to do is you need to look at how the building behaves and rocks backwards and forwards in a dynamic sense and send it off to a different wind consultant. And the only way they're able to properly assess that is by throwing the bigger structures into a wind tunnel so you can correctly assess your loads. There's no way currently to do it in an efficient way to do it by hand. So typically those big structures to get the loads out need to go to a wind tunnel assessment. Yes, most of the time you might be able to do it by code, but you're going to have significantly higher loads in those situations. So for example, if I've got the wind load in the structure, we can see significant reductions in the right areas. So you can have upwards of 60% reductions from the code averages from having a wind tunnel test. So if you've got a really tall building, ask yourself, is there going to be benefits in doing a wind tunnel test? Because I can have significant load reductions on my structure. Even seismic, even though a lot of the time it is done by computers, there's still a number of different ways that you can start off with these type of assessments. You can either start off with a static assessment, which is just that basic hand calculation that you can do. Then you can move into a more complex assessment such as RSA, which gives you an initial starting point for the loads that you need to go into. There's even bigger changes that are coming to the system that you may want to research. Instead of force-based design, which is your RSA, you want to go to a deflection-based design approach. Now, if you have a look into it and research your own topics, you'll see that a deflection-based design result will give you not only more correct answers, but can be more efficient and quicker to do. But if you're moving up in complexity for an earthquake design, you can even move into time history. As there is a time component to any earthquake action, you can get predefined records on how that building behaved over time and do a time history analysis of your structure. 
So it can be a lot of complex assessments that you need to move into at this point. So you can see loans may not be as simple as you think they are. A is for analysis. Now, the above approach, we potentially haven't even put it into an FEA yet. We're just collected all the information that we now need to plug into the tool that we need to assess. And this is where we have the next step of analysis. So what type of analysis are you going to be doing? So you need to look at, are you doing just the simple load rundown assessment? So looking at how the loads transfer through the structure, making sure that you're picking up an, any shear throw that may occur from either cantilevers or continuous spans, and just running that load from top to bottom. Or are you needing a tool that can do that time history approach? Or are you needing to have creep, shrinkage, and other effects introduced into the system to making sure the results you're getting out are correct? such as in a slab design, or are you needing a seismic tool? Now, most of the time you do not have a single tool that can do each one of these assessments. There's typically a bespoke tools for each of them. A jack of all trades is typically not the best tool for the system that you're looking at. So typically you need to look and jump into different tools to do these different assessments for you. Now, a load rundown, yes, it's a very easy to get from the slab design. So a lot of time I'll be getting the load out of the slab design, throwing it into the column design and cross-linking them here as load rundowns from things such as ETABs. I typically only use an ETABs for the seismic assessment because it potentially doesn't have the most detailed assessment of the slab design and the load transfers through your system. So you just need to look at the type of assessment that you're looking for. And if you are looking at floor designs, maybe you do need to check human induced vibration. So what is the vibration felt on the floor? And does that tool allow you to provide the RMS? So this is where you're looking at what is the output that you need to allow you to move on to the next step. Now, the last part of GLAD is design. As the name suggests is what design that you need to to make sure that you're code compliant. Do you need to assess what reinforcement you need in the structure? Do you need to assess what cracking it is achieved? Do you need to assess the deflections? So this is where you're potentially either using an inside or outside tool. The analysis software that you used above does not need to be the same as the design tool that you're using. So this is where you need to break down what assessments that you need, what do you need to show to making sure that you're actually co-compliant and have a safe structure. And if you are looking to link a number of different software so you can assess from your analysis to design software, Python is a great way that you can do this. I have a link to a video here about the basics of Python that every structural engineer should learn. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, it'd be greatly appreciated. And there's two ways that you can do this. There's both links in the below description to become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube or Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. And I'll see you next week. Bye.